That was the scene at a Hong Kong university earlier this week. A handful of protesters are still barricaded inside. The final holdouts against police. Some students tried to fight back with bows and arrows, a lo-fi weapon against a high-tech force. But many desperately sought to escape, climbing down ropes and jumping into waiting cars. Over 1,000 students were arrested. This weekend's election is widely seen as a referendum on the uprising, and there's been a huge spike in the turnout as many candidates are running on pro-democracy platforms. These demonstrations have really divided Hong Kong. And since they began, up to 20,000 paramilitary police have flooded into the city from mainland China. And there's fear the Chinese Communist Party is determined to end Hong Kong's independence with technology as part of its toolkit. Hundreds of thousands of cameras line the city streets that could be used to track and identify people. And that's why the protesters wear masks and cover their faces with umbrellas. State surveillance is a daily fact of life for people on the communist-ruled Chinese mainland where all citizens are monitored through technology. Some washrooms even have facial recognition in their toilet paper dispensers because people use too much paper. Chinese President Xi says the surveillance is all about making everyone what he calls a model citizen. But the technology has also been used to find and detain Muslim Uyghurs. According to a Chinese human rights group, over a million are now in prison-like camps like this one in Xinjiang in northern China. The New York Times reports that many of them were tracked down through facial recognition cameras and spyware on their phones. We reached out to a Canadian who lives in Hong Kong, Chris Young. He's a protester. He, he was arrested and woken up, woke up chained to a hospital bed. That was a few weeks ago after the protest, but then, right before he filmed this video for us this weekend, he was questioned by police for three hours. So you'll find the audio, it's a little hard to hear because he's outside Polytechnique University, so we put some subtitles on to help, and here's his message to Canadians. Imagine if the RCMP stormed into the University of Toronto or Queens, or spreading tear gas around the residential areas inside the malls, or in the subway stations. Hong Kong demonstrate that freedom can be taken over in a fast and dramatic way. So, a warning there, and it also explains why the students tore down these lampposts in Hong Kong. They are reportedly equipped with sensors, cameras, and internet connections, and protesters fear they're being used for facial recognition and tracking there in Hong Kong. The government there acknowledges they could easily identify people in a crowd, but they deny using them on protesters. Joining me now from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, is Zainab Tufekci. She writes for the New York Times and is the author of Twitter and Tear Gas. She spent a lot of time with protesters in Hong Kong over the past few months. So, Zainab, one of the themes that we keep seeing, even at the university, there are, are posters there that say, be aware or be next. They're sending, the protesters are sending a warning about a serious threat. What, what is that threat? That's right. In fact, uh, that threat is the threat of authoritarianism that's backed by artificial intelligence, digital technology, and a very heavy hand of the state. Uh, one of the very striking things for me while talking to the protesters in Hong Kong was how many of them just brought up, without me asking, they just brought up the situation in Xinjiang where we think maybe a million, maybe more people have been sent to internment camps, that there's this massive re-education uh, plan in place where families are being torn apart, kids are being placed in orphanages, they're not being allowed to practice any of their customs. I mean, it's one of the biggest human rights violations ongoing right now, like millions of people in camps. And it's kind of ignored by the world, even though this is such a massive thing, you hardly hear of it. Whereas in Hong Kong, I heard of it constantly. They were like, if we don't protect ourselves, they will do to us what they're doing right now in Xinjiang, and the world will not care just the way they don't care about Xinjiang. So they were very much both trying to save their own like little island of more liberties, but they were also trying to send a warning that you know if you ignore 
massive human rights violations, it just grows and grows and grows. If countries can get away with things that are otherwise obviously unacceptable because they have economic power, it goes from there and it just kind of um, encroaches to the rest of the world. You've written so much about technology and how it intersects with authoritarian governments. I mean, do you now see China spreading its technological expertise to other parts of the world, like with its repression of, of human rights? Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, just a while back, there was a Chinese company that is the biggest maker of surveillance cameras, and they were literally advertising artificial intelligence cameras that could automatically detect Uyghur ethnicity, the very ethnicity that they're sending to internment camps. So you're seeing this kind of technology be developed and you're seeing it be sold around the world to lots of countries, to lots of governments, uh, from facial recognition to dissident detection to AI in the purposes of uh, this kind of repression. You're seeing that, but also crucially, we're building similar infrastructure here. We also have a lot of surveillance. At the moment, we're just using it more for marketing. But it's also a real danger that once we build that kind of surveillance infrastructure, that the governments here will get the idea to use it in the same kinds of social control and repression uh, directed ways that the government of China right now is doing. So I feel like even though Hong Kong's a small island, it's this giant warning flare to the rest of the world that the technologies we're building, I mean, they have great size, they have great uses, but they could come and be turned against us in a serious way at the hands of authoritarian governments. The protesters have drawn a lot of attention. There's been a lot of coverage of their issue. Do they have any hope of winning? Usually when I interview protesters, I find them very optimistic. You know, they think everything's going to be great. All these people are out in the streets. Whereas these are the oldest souls I've met among protesters. They're very clear eyed. They know their adversary, mainland China, is a tough one. They know that human rights is not in the global agenda. They know they're kind of alone, but they're like, at least we're going to go down fighting and we're going to give it a shot. And I don't know what to say. I think that's a realistic assessment of where things are. Stand up, you're back to Hong Kong very soon. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for inviting me. Stand up to Fekchi in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. China is now demanding U.S. President Trump veto a Hong Kong human rights bill that was overwhelmingly approved by Congress this week. China's new ambassador to Canada warned Ottawa not to do the same. Uh, we will continue to uh, call for de-escalation and an end to violence uh, and true dialogue that will lead to a more peaceful situation. Joining me now is a former Canadian ambassador to China, David Mulroney. So we just heard this week from the, the Prime Minister, uh, he's showing concern about Hong Kong, but he's not outright condemning like the U.S. What, what did you think of that response? I thought it was far too tepid because what's happening in Hong Kong and what the demonstrators are doing is standing up for rights that Canada endorsed back in 1997. We publicly supported the deal that Britain and China did. And those, those rights are being rolled back in a very violent way by Hong Kong authorities. So we need to speak up. We should speak up. We missed an opportunity. We've heard from the ambassador from China to Canada. Basically, he doesn't seem to be afraid of telling Canada what it should or shouldn't do, uh, saying don't interfere like the U.S. What did you think of that? So we always hear a chorus of Canadian voices saying we can't speak. We can't uh, speak about unpleasant things to China. We can't mention their human rights abuses. It'll hurt their feelings. You'll notice that the ambassador isn't too worried about hurting our feelings. But why if not? He, if he chooses to speak out like this, <clears throat> and in effect, he's, he's really undermining Canadian policy since 1997, the Canadian government should respond. If I had said something like that in Beijing, I'd be called in and, you know, hectored by Chinese officials and, and threatened with being sent home. We should call him in and say, if you want to speak about Canadian policy, here are the consequences. And we're not doing that, as I understand it. So what could we say? I mean, could we make a difference? Would China even care? There are two, or a couple of big things we could do. So we should absolutely consider um, the existing legislation that we have. If people are identified with things like the kidnapping of booksellers who were then abducted and sent to China or any violations of the human rights of, of demonstrators, we should take actions, you know, freezing their assets in Canada such as they are or refusing them entry to Canada. But above all, we should speak out and we should let those folks who are, again, protesting for their legitimate rights, rights that we have endorsed, we should let them know that Canada supports them. 
So are we no longer do-gooders? Canadians see themselves as do-gooders? Are, are we bystanders? We're then? selective good-doers. So we're or do-gooders. We're, we're willing to be tough with Russia from time to time, with Saudi Arabia, maybe Venezuela, but China gets a pass. And, that, and China is the greatest threat to human freedom on the planet, and they can't be given a pass. So this takes courage, and it takes honesty, and we're showing neither. But maybe China is also an economic superpower. There's trade. There are people who are, there are the, the Spavor and Kovrig who are being held. There's the, the, the Huawei executive here. It's complicated. We convince ourselves, though, that that's always a reason for not speaking out. Uh, good diplomacy doesn't mean that you gratuitously insult another country or you grab them by the lapels and yell at them, but you've got to speak honestly. And if Canada wants to be taken seriously anywhere, it has to speak honestly in this case. And, and people are listening and waiting and watching. David Mulroney, thank you so much. Thank you.